there has been a moratorium on the fishery since 2016. So to understand what's happening to the walleye population, uh, all partners provide valuable insight and knowledge. We're going to have a better understanding of how healthy the ecosystem is as a whole, which provides important information for lake managers. In a separate study, there's been an economic valuation of the ecosystem goods and services that Lake Scugog and the Lake Scugog watershed provide. The ecological goods and services include things like biological control and biodiversity, waste treatment and water purification, water quality, habitat and refuge and biodiversity, recreation and tourism opportunities, climate regulation, aesthetic, culture and spiritual belief. The economic value of the Lake Scugog watershed provide just over $267 million per year. So the valuation is clear. Lake Scugog is definitely worth investing in, especially when we consider that $267 million of the goods and services that it gives back to us. So really our focus should be on not just protecting, but investing in the Lake Scugog watershed to increase that value. It's been such an advantage to have the opportunity to study the lake over multiple years. So often with a one-year snapshot type study, the data become anecdotal and we can't put them in the context of the changes that have happened over the recent past. There's no such thing as a regular summer anymore. Over the three years that we've been studying the lake, we've seen a very dry summer, we've seen a very wet summer, and so we need to be able to put the data that we come up with in the context of all of these variations. By capturing this variation, we can better understand what a truly unprecedented event looks like. So this Trillium-funded project may be focusing on one important lake in South Central Ontario, but the information that we're going to be getting from this three-year study is going to be so valuable to other interested stakeholders in the region, particularly other lake associations, other government bodies that are interested and concerned about invasive species, water quality, and the impact of land use on lake ecosystem health. So there are approximately 250,000 lakes in Ontario alone, and the government simply doesn't have the bandwidth to carry out multi-year studies on all of those lakes. Our research is centered on how we can conserve and rehabilitate walleye habitat. However, it's critical for us to remember, and ultimately to study, the entire food web in the lake. Walleye of different life stages occupy different habitats and different places in the food web, and so we need to understand the entire ecosystem in order to understand the impacts of different parts of their life history. It may not be immediately obvious, but changes in the chemistry of the lake can impact the algae and plants at the base of the food web, which can then impact the invertebrates, and ultimately these can lead to changes in the fish populations. Lake food webs are an interconnected mesh of relationships between organisms, and impacts to any one of those linkages can reverberate throughout the ecosystem. So Lake Scugog is a very large and diverse lake, and our results are showing that in fact the lake is quite heterogeneous. And heterogeneous means that if you look at samples from one site, say near Port Perry, what you'll find is very different. The water quality is very different and the aquatic organisms are very different, say compared to the east arm of the lake. We've also been able to see how invasive species are impacting those native species that exist in the lake. And so we've been particularly focusing on Myriophyllum spicatum, which is also known as Eurasian water milfoil, and a new invasive species that's originally from Eurasia known as Nitilopsis obtusa, also known as starry stonewort because of its little star-shaped bulbul that hangs off of its rhizomes. Even though Eurasian water milfoil is a nuisance and it's non-native, over the last 50 years that it's likely been in the lake, it hasn't had too much of a negative impact on the sport fishery, as far as we know. But now with starry stonewort in the lake, we've seen dramatic changes to the communities in these weedy beds in Lake Scugog. So starry stonewort doesn't have a root system, so it can actually control its level in the water column. It has a bit of a competitive advantage. It can shade out and smother other competing aquatic plants for nutrients and light. 
And so this is why in places like Michigan and New York State, they found that starry stonewort has had a, a major negative impact on not only their aquatic plant beds, but also the fish that live in those lakes. If you can imagine barbed wire, starry stonewort is basically this crunchy mass that makes it very difficult for larger fish to navigate, such as walleye and bass. And in particular, what we've noticed is that zebra mussels, which is also a, a non-native uh, invasive species in the lake, the numbers of zebra mussels have dramatically increased. And those zebra mussels seem to like starry stonewort. Zebra mussels graze and they filter feed the water. And as they're filter feeding, they're selectively eating phytoplankton they like, and they're selectively not feeding on microcystis, which is a blue-green algae that has now started to erupt and blooms periodically in the lake over the last couple of years. My lab is starting to show a connection between the invasion of starry stonewort into the lake, the increase in zebra mussels, and the occurrence of microcystis blooms in the lake. Having this ability to study Lake Scugog and to monitor the communities serendipitously allowed us to answer important questions related to algal blooms and invasive species. Globally, we are quickly finding ourselves in a situation where we lack viable analogs for the environmental changes that we are experiencing. And the same is true in Lake Scugog. Our species had not yet evolved the last time carbon dioxide concentrations were as high as they are in the modern atmosphere. And because of that, humans have never experienced the environment as they find it today. Understanding ecosystem change in a multiple stressor world is incredibly challenging. It's not just the impacts of warming temperatures or altered precipitation, but the simultaneous impacts of invasive species, changes in runoff from the catchment, direct consumption of organisms. All of these factors are working together to impact the lake at any given time. We know that based on the land use in the watershed, agriculture and urbanization is influencing the water quality that we see. So for example, when there's a, a severe thunderstorm or heavy rain event in the watershed, we clearly see that fecal coliform bacteria tends to uh, dramatically increase in our nearshore water samples. And what we've been able to, to determine is that in sites that are highly developed, such as near Port Perry, tend to have lower water quality profiles than, say, sites that are in the eastern arm of the lake, which is less developed. Oxygen is very important for fish, just like it is for us. And Lake Scugog, being a nutrient-rich lake, has a lot of bacteria that it's going to be decomposing that organic matter as it breaks down. And this uses up a lot of oxygen. And this is particularly a concern in the winter, when the lake is uh, covered with ice and essentially sealed off from the atmosphere. So there's no new oxygen that's coming into the lake in the winter to replenish the oxygen being used up to decompose plant matter. So winter ice and snow conditions are changing on Lake Scugog as a result of climate change. And we want to know what this means for oxygen levels under the ice. At the same time, changes in the amounts and types of algae and plants that are living in the lake also play a role because they're providing the fuel for bacteria to use up oxygen. So typically we want at least 25 volunteers around the lake. We're looking for people that have the rocky shoreline or the sandy shoreline. That's where walleye will typically spawn. Basically anywhere where we can find that type of substrate is where we need volunteers so that we can gather as much information as possible to see how many walleye are still actively spawning. So the protocol for the walleye watch is quite simple. Volunteers head to the waterfront 
and they use bright flashlights to shine the light into the water and look for the eyes of the walleye. They record some basic information like the weather and the location they're at, and then at the end of the season, we transfer all that information to the OMNRF in order to understand where the walleye are spawning. So this helps the OMNRF to keep track of the walleye population, to see whether walleye are using the spawning locations that have historically been identified, and to see if there are any new locations that they might be spawning in that we aren't aware of from before. The areas we've been able to expand our study into was to try and understand the influence of Lake Scugog's tributaries, the streams and rivers that enter into the lake, in order to understand the impact that they have on the ecosystem as a whole. These locations may potentially be historically important spawning areas for walleye. According to local community members, the Nankuan River is where walleye have always come to spawn. We're curious to know if this is still the case, or if minor adjustments need to be made to the habitat to become more welcoming. So what we're doing for this particular project is investigating what tributaries are the best in terms of supporting spawning populations of walleye. This information will ultimately help prioritize stewardship and monitoring efforts to help further increase the population of walleye in the lake. There are so many small things that individuals can do to improve the quality of water in the lake around them. Everyone thinks only about the people who live directly on the shoreline, but everyone in the catchment, everyone in the region has a role to play in improving the quality of the lake water. It really doesn't have to be a large undertaking. It can be small acts of changing behaviors, changing you know, use of fertilizers. Our goal is to minimize the amount of material that goes directly into the sewer systems and therefore straight into the lake ecosystem. There are many ways to contribute to the health of your property, neighborhood and watershed, such as planting native trees and shrubs and wildflowers and grasses on your property, using environmental lawn maintenance practices, avoiding the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides, work with environmentally friendly materials such as permeable paving and sustainably harvested wood, Leave a minimum of three feet of natural vegetation along creeks and lakes, and plant native shrubs, flowers, and grasses to help protect the shoreline. Conserve water by planting drought-tolerant species and use rain barrels or cisterns. Create a rain garden. Remove invasive plants that enter your yard, and reduce or eliminate pollutants such as litter, oil spills, and overuse of de-icing salt. Will any one of these changes result in a massive improvement in the quality of the lake? No but together they will all add up to big changes that will help improve the quality of the water in the lake ecosystem. One of the greatest successes that came out of uh, this OTF funded project was the participation of citizen science. With a lot of the logistics and even the sampling, we could not have collected as much good data as we did without their help. They spent about 300 hours collectively. That is an amazing commitment. And again, there can never be enough thanks to them for helping us succeed in this project. I think it's a major misconception that people who care about the environment don't care about the growth of the community itself. We recognize that we are living in an environment that has a growing population base. We just want to ensure that the growth occurs in a responsible manner so that growth in the community doesn't result in negative impacts to the lake itself. We can do it in a smart way and this is known as smart growth. Part of this smart growth approach is thinking about low impact design. So low impact design is uh, a way of designing our communities and subdivisions to help slow that stormwater that enters waterways. Something that can happen when we have these long-term studies is we have uh, community members that are actually experiencing study fatigue. 
Although we can understand this, we, we really do have a, a reason why we need to study things for more than a year, more than two, sometimes even more than three. There's so many processes going on in the lake. We have to make sure that we're capturing all of the drivers. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Uh, if there was, it would make all of our jobs much, much easier. That's why this study in particular is really important that we're contacting other agencies and we're including our, our provincial governments to look at the data. So it is our hope that the information that we've been able to include in our report, our final report for the Trillium grant, will be used by our partners, Corthra Conservation and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, but other government bodies as well that are interested and concerned about water quality and invasive species in Ontario's lake.